we're gonna bring in Julian here to tell us more about that. Hey, Julian, how's it going? Hey, it's good. How are you? Doing well, good. can you please uh, introduce yourself to the audience and tell them what you do at, at AWS? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So Julian LaBlock, based in Northern California, and I am the principal product manager for a new service that we launched under Gated Preview at reInvent in 2022, which is called Amazon Verified Permissions. All right, we should probably, you, you got the keyword in there, right? Permissions, right? Uh -huh. I'm going to go straight to the elephant in the room here. <laughs> uh, that I'm outnumbered right now? Uh, well, you are outnumbered, yeah. You've got two brits now, so sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, when, when we think of AWS and permissions, right, I would imagine the majority of people who know anything about AWS are going to go, oh, it's identity access management, I am. So how is this different? Yeah. And what is it, basically? <laughs> <laughs> what is it and how is it different? <laughs> yeah. So the purpose is for developers building custom applications. Okay. So uh, picture yourself as a development team out there and you're building an application. So maybe that's an application that gives, you know, you're, you're working for a financial services organization and that application gives your customers access to their financial accounts. Or, or maybe you're doing the, late, the next generation of photo sharing applications or you're building an HR system for your workforce or maybe it's a multi-tenant SaaS. So, Whatever type of application you're building, you're going to need to think about how you manage permissions within that application. And that's a slightly different problem space to what IAM is addressing, which is actually protecting the underlying AWS infrastructure services. So IAM will say you can or cannot call this AWS API. What we're doing is we're taking that up to the next level. And so your application has a whole load of APIs. Your financial services application is going to have an API to create a new payee on an account. Your HR application is going to have an API to approve somebody's time off request or a submit an appraisal for evaluation. You're going to want to build a permission system within your application that, that determines who in your application is allowed to do what who's allowed to create an account on a, a payee on a new account, who's allowed to approve a time off request, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've built elevates what IAM does at the API level for AWS and now gives our customers a service when they're building their applications to implement permissions management and authorization within their applications. So it's a, so it's a permissions model for or permissions um it's a permissions engine uh, engine right for the yeah. logical functionality in my application and then yeah exactly. and then if the application is running on aws under the hood you know i am would be controlling oh this app can or cannot call this api Julian, aws api sometimes the universe aligns and brings people together yes and they have brought you and you and i together today uh you and me oh, sorry. sorry my grammar was was off there <laughs> you and me together uh, because I have built a permissions engine into an application before oh. and it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it is really, really hard. I once upon a time was a failed co-founder of a startup, uh, and we were building, uh, we were decoupling. So, you know, we've got object storage, right. Uh, and, and all these object storage systems, are lacking uh, file level and folder level permissions, right? And, all, and a lot of things like that. Uh, so uh, uh, the co-founder and I built an application that would allow you to implement on top of object storage outside of it, file and folder level style permissions on top of object storage. Uh, and building in a permission engine and like having nested permissions and, you know, I can access this folder because I have access due to this thing. Uh, but I can't because of this. Other That's really hard and it gets really complex and mm. it was not fun to build, uh, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, I am actually really, really excited to hear about this. Um, mm. this, this, this service, this sounds incredibly, incredibly useful for the people that have experienced this pain. Mm. It is. And we've had, like, you know, as always, we go through and we talk to tons of customers about what they're trying to do. And the number of customers have said to us, we've gone down this path 
we've tried to build it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is as honest as you and uses the word failed, but clearly it is something that teams struggle with because the complexity of it grows exponentially as the volume of transactions that you have to deal with and the complexity of use cases in terms of the type of permissions rules that you want to put in place grow. So all of a sudden you're like, okay, it seems to be able to do the logic that I built, but it now takes one and a half seconds for every authorization decision. Mm -hmm. Or we seem to have hit a brick wall in terms of the number of roles we can support. And so these kind of problems manifest and they manifest at a point in the development cycle where you've gone down a long way down that blind alley and it's tough to reverse. So being able to offer our customers a day one solution that can grow with them, start with simple use cases, evolve to more complex ones around attribute-based access control, deep hierarchies of roles, et cetera, is proving very compelling with the customers that we're talking to. And, and let's be honest too, uh, if, if you were to wait the value of like coding, right? Of code for an application um, in terms of the highest weighted code is what achieves your application's, you know, business logic that powers your application and your, your company and makes you money. Uh, permission systems and engines are pretty low on that list because they are not really driving the value of your business they're just needed right they're just necessary so it's a bunch of code that you have to write that you don't necessarily really get that much out of except for you have to have it because you have to have these specific access patterns or, or control lists that are are applicable to your application it's not driving the actual business value for for most people's applications Absolutely. I mean, it's a classic case of undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned ACLs there because I know we distinguished verified permissions from IAM earlier on, but somebody has just asked on chat how it differs from LDAP in AD. So, so LDAP is giving you access control lists clearly and gives you a certain amount of um, depth there. But when you're getting into attribute-based access control, where you're starting to define permissions along the lines of um, this user may do this action if they're in this role and the following attributes are met. And those attributes are a combination of attributes of the resource, mm -hmm. attributes of the principle, and contextual attributes like did they log in through multi-factor authentication? What region are they coming in? What time of day is it? What time, what day of week is it? That's where those complexity of permissions rules, you sort of hit a wall with what you can do with your, your basic LDAP model. I also look at like something like Active Directory, and that's mainly applicable to your, your company's users, right? You're not generally yep. extending Active Directory to uh, yeah. application users. Yeah. Uh, like, so if you're building a, business to consumer application, the consumers are not going to be in your active directory anyway. Um, mm -hmm. You'll have some sort of other uh, user management, you know, like something like AWS uh, version, uh, you know, Cognito. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Julian, my understanding, uh, you know, just, just looking through verified permissions, there, there's actually a policy language that comes mm -hmm. along with uh, verified permissions uh, it's called Cedar, right? Um, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. As in the tree. As in the tree. Yeah. Do you, do you want to talk a bit about that that policy language and, and why uh, that, that was created for this? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, when we, when we set about this project, there are a number of criteria that we had for the policy language that we were going to use. And we were at the outset very amenable to taking an established policy language. There are a few of them out there and, and using it. We didn't deliberately set about on point of principle to, to build our own policy language. Our criteria were that A, it needed to be relatively easy for a non-technical person to be able to read a policy and understand it. Um, we wanted um, compliance officers, legal teams to be able to look at a policy and kind of figure out what that policy was saying, what okay. that what that policy was doing. A second criteria was very much oriented towards performance. We, we know that 
in order to use this properly, the application is going to be calling this engine repetitively for each and every action that the user tries to do. So we need to hit latencies in the very low, in, in the kind of, you know, 10 to 10 to 30 millisecond range in order to give customers the confidence to be able to repeatedly hit the system with those requests. And the third criteria that we had was we wanted the policy language to be amenable to automated reasoning. As the number of policies grow, it becomes increasingly impractical for a human being to look across that policy set and understand what the constraints, what the boundaries of that policy set are. And as AWS, we've invested a, a lot of time and money over the last few years in the, in the science of automated reasoning. And we wanted to be able to bring that to bear to the subject of policy analysis. So those three criteria, easy for a human to understand, easy for a machine to understand, and highly performant, really when we looked at the options that were out there as established options, we concluded that we really needed to define a policy language from scratch to address those three criteria. And so that's what took us down the path of defining the CEDA policy language. And you talked to Chauvin just before I came on. I mean, the Amazon verified access, sorry, AWS verified access service also uses CEDA as a policy language. And, you know, we have great plans to use the CEDA policy language more widely across the, the portfolio. I love it. Steve, do you have a question? Oh, I was curious, and I mean, we, we already touched on IAM earlier on, but how does this work with other AWS services? Does it work with other AWS yeah. services? Yeah, yeah, smart question. So the uh, it's designed to be relatively independent of other services. What we didn't want to do is come forward with a permissions management system that would only work with Cognito or would only work with Identity Center or would only work with a, a API Gateway. So it's, it's sufficiently decoupled that you can use Amazon Verified Permissions regardless of where you're managing your identities. Okay. Essentially, the application will go get the identity information from your identity provider. It could be Cognito, it could be any one of a number of other partners, and then push that identity information into Amazon Verified Permissions and say, okay, based on this identity information, this data, these attributes, these group memberships, is this user allowed to take this action? So it is pretty decoupled from other AWS services because we want it to be able to be used by developers regardless of what platforms they're building their application on. Now, with that said, we are obviously very keen to build a strong, better together story with services like Cognito, like Identity Center, like AppSync, like API Gateway, mm -hmm. so that customers who are building applications on that set of platforms will experience a well joined up solution um, that you know affords benefits because you're using a combination of AWS services. So to give like a tangible example, we want to get to the point where if you're using say um, Cognito or Identity Center or one of our partner IDPs, then the information would flow more naturally from the IDP into the CEDA policy engine to make a decision. The uh, uh, Amazon verified permissions would be go out and discover the schema of your identity provider in order to give you a framework for building policies based on attributes supplied by that identity provider. So you will see integrations down the road between these different services that enable us to build a strong, better together story. But it's heart, it is independent of any given identity provider or gateway or resource source. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it definitely begs the question of like, when, when would I use, uh, you know, my service that is running in AWS to just assume a role and, uh, you know, have access versus, you know, the, the, the actual principle uh, or identity of the, the person or thing uh, utilizing the policy engine, I'm sure. Uh, but I, when I was just looking at the documentation a bit too, it looks like yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. You, you declare out, you know, your principle comes yeah, in from actually, your IDP 
uh, you, you define out the action that they're able to take and you can define out, I'm guessing it's just an arbitrary resource, right? It, it, the example I'm looking at is uh, a JPEG file, right? Um, but do, could you define out whatever resource uh, that is or, or does it have to point to something that is quote unquote real, I guess? Uh, like how do you determine what a resource is in the policy engine? If that's not too yeah. empiric of a question. <laughs> No, it, 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 it's an astute question. Like, essentially, the, the beauty of it is you don't you define within the policy engine a schema for your resources. What okay. do I mean by that? I mean, you say, okay, I have these resources. They have these attributes. They're organized into this hierarchy. Right. And now I'm going to create a set of policies based around that schema. So I'm going to consider this attribute in terms of whether or not somebody's allowed to access the resource. I'm going to consider whether this resource is a member of this group in terms of a policy that determines whether some other principle is allowed to access it. The service itself really is pretty decoupled from the physical reality of where those resources are stored or indeed what they represent. Right. The service doesn't intrinsically know that it's dealing with photos. It just knows that it has this resource of type photo that has these attributes, create, date, tagged, private, yes, no, and is able to define policies around that. But it really doesn't care where that resource is stored or whether that resource physically exists or it's just a digital abstraction or whatever. So I always say kind of like, this system can define rules around who's allowed to walk my dog. It's not it's really, a, it's a, it's a permissions and rules engine for you to define permissions and rules around who's allowed to do what, and then go ask it. Okay. Given this set of data, yeah. is this principle allowed to take this action on this resource? The system is itself pretty agnostic as to the nature of those resources or where those principles are stored or what those actions actually physically represent in the real world. It doesn't know if the dog truly exists or not. It just knows yeah, that exactly. you are allowed to walk the dog if there is a dog, if right? there is indeed a dog. Right. Yeah. Which is and, good. We all know on the internet, no one knows whether you're a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am a dog, actually. Uh, it was just in a trench coat, um, like three dogs stacked on top of each other. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Um, sorry, Tim, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, you're good. So looking at through the docs, I can see there's all they're all like allow actions. Mm -hmm. Is there built into this the concept of a deny action, or is that implicit if I don't define uh, a policy? It's an you know it's an implicit deny. Both are true. So oh, you okay. it is implicitly a deny if there is no explicit permit. Okay. But in addition to that, you can define explicit denies, which will always trump any permits. So you can create a guardrail policy that says, under no circumstances may anybody from outside of the organization edit this file. Okay. And or inside, inside an org, this group can access, but this group cannot. Yeah. 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 And now, even if you accidentally create a permit policy that says somebody from the outside of the organization can edit the file, that permit policy won't apply because the guardrail that you've created in the form of the deny policy or forbid right. policy will Trump's. prevent that from happening. Makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah it, looks, it looks pretty straightforward from the docs. It does. He uh, says famous last words. Right, exactly. This is security, yeah. right? <laughs> security is never that straightforward. <laughs> never um, that straightforward. I've been working for a year. I was like, this doesn't look that complicated. This isn't even a <laughs> here. And then the deeper you get into it, yeah, it's kind uh, of. Permissions are hard. Mm -hmm. Permissions are easy to get wrong. Uh, like I said, from personal experience, very difficult yeah, to build sure. one of these things. And it is, uh, it's not really, unless like, you're building something like this, it is not really that valuable to most people's business applications other than the fact that they have to have it because they have to deny access mm -hmm. or allow access. Um, it's not actually serving the purpose of the application itself in general. But before we, before we were running short on time here, Julian, before we have to move on, did you want to go through maybe just some, some, you know, we've talked through as we've been talking some examples, but, but any, 
any other areas where people should be thinking like, oh, yes, this is when I need fine grained access controls. And this is where, uh, you know, Amazon verified permissions comes into play. So, I mean, like, firstly, the what I've been struck with as I've been working on this is just the breadth of use cases that we are uncovering as we talk to different customers. So, I mean, every industry vertical from financial services to manufacturing to, you know, software as a service to pharmaceuticals to you name it, there are use cases that people are looking for this generalized permissions management model that's scalable and that they're, 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 what, what many are finding compelling is the, the ability to analyze those permissions, especially when you start to deploy this consistently across a suite of applications. And now you're in the unique position of being able to say, okay, not just for this applica HR application, but if I look across all of my internal enterprise applications, I now have a single view on what a particular employee can do or who can access this class of data. We've seen, broadly speaking, I would say the use cases break down into um, business to consumer where, where we have customers who are putting services out there, publicly available, online banking, electronic medical records, you name it. And their customers are coming in, accessing those resources and you need permissions management models around that. A large number of use cases in terms of internal workforce applications, either SaaS applications that customers are building and deploying for multiple customers, or indeed applications that organizations are building and deploying internally to be used by their employee base. And then some fantastic outliers, a lot of machine to machine use cases where we see significant scale, um, you know, literally millions of transactions a second. Mm. Um, we've seen people want to use it in space. <laughs> we've seen it. <laughs> it's cool. The number of, and, and what it does is it speaks to this is, there's a generalized model here. Yes. That is applicable across multiple different verticals, but then it clearly each vertical has its idiosyncrasies. I love it. Uh, this is, this is your, like I said, this, uh, this is a problem that I experienced firsthand. So if, if I did, I know that there's tons of people out there. Um, and it sounds like you've confirmed that as well. So good. Yeah. Uh, but Julian, thank you so much for joining mm. us. Uh, really exciting, uh, launch here uh i'm definitely gonna go check this out more in depth for sure um but we unfortunately have to move to our final guest yeah. of the evening thank you julian i hope to see you again thank you appreciate the opportunity to talk about my favorite topic yeah <laughs>